I've got a new party member. All right. I intentionally didn't do this last episode because we're running out of time, but let's actually talk to him. What the hell is... Nah, getting dizzy. Oh, that was pretty... So I actually started reading out loud that he was thinking he, that he's getting a disease, and I'm like, oh, well, I don't know why you're on a mission to do that, but okay. Flames curl around Ignis's throat, and a tongue of, uh, god damn it, of flame streams from behind his blackened teeth. Yes. Ignis, what happened to make you this way? This way. A small pocket of flesh on Ignis's cheek pops and returns in a steaming trickle and runs in a streaming uh, tick <laughs> blah, blah, blah. A small pocket of flesh on Ignis's cheek pops, then runs in a steaming trickle down his jaw. This way. Ignis always was. But you look human, or at least you look like you were human once. Ignis twists, hunching his head forward as his body spins slowly above the ground. The effect is much like a fiery windmill. Thermals screaming off his body and distorting the air around him. Still, Ignis, always Ignis. What the fuck is this party member? Never mind, then I had some other quests. You open your mouth to speak. Ignis suddenly whirls on, whirls on you. You're forced to choke back your words as the heat from his frame floods over you. Ignis, might you be sparks in bodies, always seeking to rise? Sparks in bodies? What do you mean? All things burn inside. Ignis's head cranes back and throws his arms wide, spirals of flame and heat traveling up his arms, only need to be kindled with flames to become Ignis. So might you have been Ignis. Actually, if you, if you end up trying to kindle the flames within people, you usually end up killing them. Yes, Ignis grins, cocking his head to one side, ashes falling from his skull and being swept up in the flaming wreath that surrounds him. Kss. Your heart jumps as Ignis soars several feet into the air, and his jaw tears open, fiery trails spilling forth like a nest of snakes. No more talk and questions. Silence. But I wish to speak of flames, Ignis, and of burning. Your words are like oil. Your words are like oil, and you watch them fill Ignis' eyes, fanning the flames you see there. Flames? Ignis drifts down slightly, the heat around him rising as if in interest. Speak. Ignis will listen. Is Ignis, is it true you burned down the alley of dangerous angles? Ignis's face splits, the flesh around the corner of his mouth cracking, then re-melting into charred, sneering red and black pieces. Yes, a dream shall Ignis share. You literally cannot say yes. You can only pick the options and, and say you don't want the dream, even though dreams usually do good things in this game. Maybe later. For now, I wish to speak more of Bert. A torrent of flames pours from Ignis, and you take a step back, the air bending from the heat. Streets at night, so cold. Ignis burn the buildings, the dwellers all ran from Ignis. The flames and the buildings were as flames. Screams as the dwellers became torches. Listen quietly, wait for his ranting to die. 
buildings as skeletons, angles, bodies as skeletons, reds and oranges and blacks, the flames spreading, caressing, such lights. <laughs> Ignis's fury dies, the wreaths of flame surrounding him ebbing somewhat. He seems to be lost in thought, perhaps lost in memory. S and Ignis was pleased. What were you doing in the smoldering corpse bar? For a moment you don't think Ignis has heard you. When suddenly the fires in his eyes dim slightly, and he gives a soft hiss, cinders and ash dancing at the edges of his jaw. Ignis once knew nothing of flames. Yes. Once Ignis knew nothing of flames. He set small fires. Tiny flames, tiny flickerings, small bits of flame. Ignis hints, hisses again, ashes and fiery motes drifting from the ruin of his mouth. The fires grew. Ignis set fires in their streets, and the light of the, and lit the fires of anger in their hearts. Yes. You speak, but Ignis doesn't seem to hear you. He seems to be somewhere else, as if reliving a memory through his words. Against your will, you stop and listen. They sought to punish Ignis, the small flies from the hive. They wished to see Ignis burn. After Ignis set fire to their streets, tiny magelings, hedge wizards, Rune casters, tiny sparks of magic came to punish Ignis for hurting their loved ones. They sentenced Ignis to burn, made Ignis a torch, a splitting, a spitting flame, burning, burning. It was justice, they said. Justice. You watch, mesmerized, as Ignis begins to slowly, begins slowly turning again, as he did above the grill in the smoldering corpse. But it was not, but it was not a sentence. There is so much flames and pain that there is no pain. There is light and heat, and the flesh runs as tallow across my bones. And for the first time, Ignis is pleased. Ignis stops his rotation, and his, eye, his gaze falls upon you. As it does, the fires in his eyes flare, and a charred grin splits his features. The flesh crackling and bubbling as it melts and streams across his face. Ignis wears the face of all hells, of flames, and his next words are spoken like a death sentence. Not only for you, but for everyone, everywhere. When the plains burn and all life torches, then Ignis shall at last be at peace. He's, ne he's chaotic neutral? <laughs> what does chaotic evil sound like? I just, I'm like, I guess he's not motivated by cruelty or the, s the specific desire to murder, but just a weird, unfeeling, like, nonsensical desire for everything to burn regardless of context. I guess that would make, is what makes him chaotic neutral somehow. I don't know. I don't think he exactly fits in with Anna as being the same category. I don't know. <clears throat> Ignis, I spoke with the storyteller in the hive, and he mentioned that someone taught you these things. Who? Where is it? 6,000. Of learnings and teachings you know. 
gouts of flame erupt from Ignis's mouth in a horrid semblance of laughter. You have always taught Ignis. Ignis's master, you were. Me? Are you sure? Updated my journal. Ignis's voice drops, and the crackling of flames dies. Yes, it is the only reason Ignis obeys you. Flames rise about, around him in a crackling spiral. Till death comes for us both, your words to me, to your student, Ignis. Ignis has not forgotten, master. Ignis, if I was your master, can you remember anything about me? Ignis hisses, and for a moment his features flicker. At first you think it's the flames, but it's not. It's the flickering of memory. The crackling of Ignis's flames subsides, lessening as the charred bones of Ignis's body fold up, twisting into itself until his limbs die, uh, lie motionless becoming a stack of wood within a huge iron fireplace. You are staring into a fire, burning brightly within a vaulted room. The fire crackles and spits embers onto the stone floor, motes rising from the fireplace. Faintly, from the darkness behind you, you can hear the rasp of someone breathing. I can hear you. Step into the light. There is a shuffling of sandals and a frail youth steps into the edges of the firelight. His wide black eyes catch the flames and mirror them. He is nervous. You can hear his muscles shaking, his voice trembling, just enough to increase your irritation. Forgive my intrusion, master, I... You have already intruded, supplicant. You did so with intention. I will hear it now so that you will leave me to my thoughts. The boy takes a deep breath and glances at the fire. But master, I dr dreamed of flames again last night. They, they felt real. As you said that you were to come, and you said that we were to come to you if it was a dream. Nothing more, now leave. The boy does not move. His brows draw together and slowly he displays his hands. The flesh around the fingers blackened, burned. How did your hands come to be burned, supplicant? I awoke with my hands. I awoke and my hands were as ash. The boy meets your gaze. He is still trembling, faintly, but there is an eagerness in his voice which angers you. I dreamed I soared above the earth and the ground and sky were as fire. The world itself was so bright that it hurt to look at it, master. And when I awoke, my hands, they were burned, as if I had held a flame within my hands. You lie, supplicant. You have come to me with a story, and now you are in danger of angering me. No, master. The boy's face glistens with a sweaty sheen of fear. No. Upon my life, I do not. You burned yourself with a candle, supplicant, or thrust your hand within one of the pyres in the vault of currents. Now you come to me and tell me a dream burned you. I tire of your lies. The boy falls silent, and to your surprise, his face clenches in anger. No. I do not lie. It was the dream that burned me, master. As you said it might, if we felt the power stirring. They were your words, and I came to repeat them to you and tell you that they are true. He holds up his hands. Look, master. Grab his hands. Before the boy can react, your hand, huge in comparison, lashes out, crushing his burned hands in his grip. And the boy screams echoing in the vault. With a snarl, you hurl him to the ground in front of the fireplace, and there's a sharp crack as his knees strike the flagstones. Look into those flames, supplicant. 
Raise your head. Look. The boy is shuddering with the pain from his knees. You watch tears blur his eyes as he raises his head to look into the fireplace. The flames cast his face in a red, gaunt glow. Is that what you wish to hold, supplicant? Is this shaping of flames what stirs your heart? Know that flames can burn, and if you would learn their power, you must suffer their touch. The boy is silent, staring into the flames. He seems mesmerized. His tears have dried in the heat, and the shaking is gone. The flames are his focus. He is not listening to you, and you feel fury washing over you. If that is what consumes you, enough for you to intrude upon my meditations, then I shall teach you of the shaping of flames, supplicant. Your hand lashes out and clamps onto the boy's wrist. He howls as you drag him closer to the fireplace, then thrust his hands into the coals. There is a crackling, a hissing of burning flesh, and his screams. Such terrible, yet... To learn, you must suffer. You must allow yourself to be burned by the power of that which you wield. Know its torment, and you shall know how to use it against your enemies. Updated my journal. Your vision clears, the memory streaming away like smoke. Ignis is hovering above you, his head cocked to one side, and an insane, blackened grin smeared across his face. Master, Ignis has not forgotten your teachings. Well, I was a dickhead. Ignis, are you sure your teacher was me? Ignis's voice drops, and the crackling of the flames dies. Yes, it is the only reason Ignis obeys you. Right. Same dialogue as before. I need some water real quick. Voices are shouting me. Ignis, about your teaching, about the torments I subjected to you, I'm sorry. Flames, no torments. Ignis slowly turns, twisting above the ground. He may have heard you, but you don't know if any of the words meant anything to him. At least I tried. I have no further questions. Let your dreams be filled with flames, Ignis. Uh. Let's see. No, speak! Ignis howls, and the air around you twists again from the sheer amount of heat. Speak of flames! Speak of the burning! Ignis, have you ever felt a burning, a building of flame? The flames licking the edges of the timbers, blackening the wood beneath, watching the heat peel the paint from the walls, thatch crackling, the smell of burning straw. As you speak, the crackling of flames around Ignis's flame frame ebbs, as if the flames themselves are listening to your words. When you finish, Ignis hisses softly and the flames in your eyes, his eyes have dimmed, and he is lost in a memory. Yes. We'll speak later then, Ignis. Stay calm in the meantime. Well, he's a lot. <laughs> uh, do we have dialogue with the, with the existing characters about the fact that a fire person is walking around with us? I wanted to ask you about our travels. What can you tell me about the city of Sigil? It is known by the name Sigil, 
among the people. It is known as the city that does not know itself. Doesn't know itself? What do you mean? The city exists, but it does not know itself. In not knowing itself, its existence is fl- Okay, I remember this. I keep kind of like expecting new dialogue from these characters, just kind of, like... Because I, I said this before, but I, like, I'm, I'm primed by the rhythm of KOTOR and Mass Effect as far as like how Bioware handles its party members. And so I always kind of just expect more dialogue here and there from other party members. And it just doesn't always work out that way. Kind of curious about other people's reactions to Fell. I haven't visited here for a while. Nothing new, really. Tomb of the Restless Dead. Limited uses. The Razor Angel one, that's, that's not new. Tattoo of the Warrior. Plus one AC, plus one strength, plus three base hit points. Fighters only. Enhances your natural talent for combat, making you more difficult to hit, and raising your damage with every strike. Raising your damage with every strike? I assume they just mean that every strike does more damage because you have more strength, and not that every strike literally raises your damage like it ramps up. But I'm not sure. The Bone Singer. Tattoo of Tenement Shadows? Tattoo tells of your experiences escaping the Tenement of Starved Dogs. The tattoo, which has the same color as Adder's Tear, which Sybil gave you, gives you additional bonus to stealth as long as it's described in your flesh. I've not used stealth all that much. Detect evil. Tattoo of Justice's Eye. The tattoo tells of your efforts to help Trist and depict depicts the arrest and trial of Byron Pickett. This tattoo bolsters the eye and mind of its wearer and allows the wearer to perceive injustices and grants the user the strength to correct them. The tattoo's power may only be used in a limited number of times. But when Detect Evil is exhausted, the tattoo will remain. Hmm. Trist's Savior. Plus three saves versus Paralyze? A lot of quests that you did in the past that become things. Interesting. I don't know how useful Detect Evil is, specifically. Like, what's the use case in here? Raise Dead. Saved Dimtree's life by granting him a second to death. Grossix Demise. Improved Strength. Limited Use. So we're killing the Abishi. Dreams of S. Anon. Plus one save against spells, plus two base hit points. For some reason, the tale of the Crier of S. Amon filled you with a strange nostalgia, which you have related to Fel. This tattoo draws upon both this nostalgia and the perseverance of the Criers of S. Anon, granting you a boon to your health and your endurance. Artistically, this is some of Fel's best work, although the tattoo shows the barest image of Essanon of Essanon that you heard from the crier of Essanon. You can almost feel the great spiraling parks and avenues of light through this intricate symbol. This tattoo helps preserve the memory of the city and the dream of its people that that its majesty might be remembered. Huh. Why not, I guess? Ignis tattoo? Resistance to fire and magical fire. Plus one constitution, plus three base hit points, 15% resistance to magic, minus one wisdom. Oh, minus 15 resistance to magic. Mixed things. Having Ignis as a companion is allowing you to see flames and madness in a different light. When this tattoo was worn, you may draw upon Ignis's fury to shrug off flame attacks and increase your constitution, making your threshold of pain that much higher. Unfortunately, since Ignis's strength lies in his madness, your wisdom is impaired when this tattoo is worn upon the skin and your susceptibility to magical attacks increases. This tattoo can only call upon its ability to protect the wearer from flames for a limited number of times. When the tattoo's power is exhausted, however, the constitution bonus will remain. Oh, that's a temporary effect you activate. It feels weird to have the tattoos be limited use.
Plus nine to base hit points. Plus two con. Plus two intelligence. Just kind of a generally good reminder that these characters do indeed can use tattoos. Rings, chest, wrist, hand. Okay, so Ignis can't wear tattoos, probably because he doesn't have regular skin. But you've got at least one remaining tattoo slot. You've got a remaining one. Done. Endure. This Endure one's cheap. Grow strong. See? This one's cheap, so why not? Negative one AC. There you go. Here's the negative token from earlier. Special. Ward against shadows. Special. Hold shadow creatures temporarily. This is a negative token. A flat, black disc that appears to have no substance to it at all. Turning it over reveals that it has no third dimension. There is no thickness to this item at all. It gives you some command over creatures of shadow. You can command them to stand still for a few precious seconds. The more powerful the shadow, the less likely it is to obey your command. As an added benefit, as long as this token is carried by any of your party members, it acts as a ward against shadows. It will not prevent shadows from attacking your group, but the shadows will find it more difficult to harm you when the token is carried. Goes into a ring slot. Okay. Might as well. Just a little bit of strangeness. Ignis is such a weird party member. Do I know who the next one's gonna be? You see? Anna, Dekon, Ignis, Mort. Me! You know, we have all these people. I don't have Mort right now. But there's one more slot besides where Mort would go. I wonder where that person's hiding that I seemingly haven't even met yet. Given how this seems to work. Have I outlasted the thugs? Am I too scary? Are there too many people in my party? I don't seem to be attacked in the streets anymore. I think it like just like turned off the moment I got through the alley of lingering sighs. The brothel of slating intellectual lusts. What a name. Done. Sup? My friend's on fire? Don't worry, it's normal. Fall from grace. Oh, they got wings. Before you was a stunning golden-haired woman, dressed in an azure and violet dress. With two long, elegant wings draped across her shoulders, she is surveying the room with a slight smile. She is easily the most beautiful woman you have ever seen. Greetings. Well met, traveler. How may I help you? Voice acting. Th that, that could be a thing. The woman turns as you address her. She takes your measure then nods slightly. You notice her eyes are azure, the exact same color as her dress. She reaches up to brush the back, back a stray lock of golden hair. Who are you? Updated my journal. I am called Fall From Grace. She studies you for a moment. You are new to Sigil, are you not? No, I suspect I have been here for quite some time, actually. Fall from Grace raises an eyebrow. Indeed. Yes. But that is a, ta a long tale. Perhaps longer than I know. I'm more interested in what this place is. This is the brothel of slating intellectual lusts. She, sh she studies you for a moment. 
I take it from your question that you did not intend to partake in this establishment. Brothel of slating intellectual lusts. What kind of brothel is this? I established this brothel to give those lustful fevers that strike the mind more avenues of expression rather than simply carnal. Much pleasure could be had in conversation and engaging with the verbal arts with others. So this is a brothel where there's no intercourse, only of a psychological nature. Rest assured, it is still quite stimulating. I have to ask, why did you establish such a place? Falls, fall from Grace raises an eyebrow. That is an odd question. She frowns. I don't think anyone has ever asked me that, at least directly. My apologies, Lady Grace. I didn't mean to be so direct. I was merely curious. Oh, no apologies are necessary. I am more than happy to discuss the reasons with you if you wish. I would like to hear them, yes. Part of the answer to your question requires that you know that I am a member of the Society of Sensation. Our faction believes that one should experience as much of the multiverse as possible. And that is why you established this place? The brothel, is, the brothel is intended to slate the lusts of even the hardened intellectual. It is designed to stimulate the mind, to heighten one's awareness of themselves and others, to create new ways of experiencing another person. It is for those who seek something more than the shallow, physical pleasures that fill the hive and lower wards. Well, I wouldn't call them shall- er, I mean, I can understand that. The women here must be special, indeed. <laughs> shallow? No, it's actually a very large, uh, uh. The women here are aspiring sensates. They have come to me in search of instruction, to prepare themselves to enter the faction. Also, many of them have a natural grasp on language that can shatter the crust of the most hardened individual. Sensates. She bows slightly. Yes, I am a member of the Society of Sensation. Ding. <laughs> the science of sensation. That fucking like theater intro. Our faction believes that one should experience as much of the multiverse as possible. And the girls here are training to be sensates. Yes. I hope that by learning the art of language and the subtleties, the patrons and the students here may learn more about themselves. One is only as limited as their command of language. To be able to employ language to evoke emotions in others is a tremendous skill. If I may ask, Lady Grace, the wings on your back, you are not human, I take it. She's one of the fiends, one of the succubi she is. She'll take your measure, and then she'll take your soul to the lower plane, so she will. Your companion is correct. I am a lesser tanari, more specifically a succubus. She gives a soft laugh. I'm afraid we're a little too common in the lower plains and elsewhere for our own good. Most of my race spend their time seducing mortals from, with various pleasures of the flesh. And you? Updated my journal. I'd like to think that I have distanced myself from that. It is ultimately a trivial and non-productive way for one to spend one's time here in the multiverse. There is much more to life, wouldn't you agree? Perhaps so. Can I ask some other questions? I came here looking for help. Perhaps you can help me. Help? What kind of help are you looking for? I seem to have lost my memories. In so doing, I've lost myself. You've been stricken with amnesia. Fall from Grace looks pained. How terrible. Do you have any idea how it happened? Not really. At least not that I can remember. I woke up on a slab in the mortuary, and everything before that is black. 
You walk in the mortuary? I think the dustmen mistook me for dead. Or I was dead. Or something. All I know is that I regenerate wounds quickly. I could be immortal. But, don't even, but I don't even know that for sure. Fall from Grace seems to be appraising you with renewed interest. Those scars on your body. She reaches out a hand as if to touch you. May I? Yes. Fall from Grace drags her finger across your chest lightly, tracing the edges of your scars and following the curves where they blend into some of your tattoos. She seems fascinated. These scars do look as if they would have taken several lifetimes to accumulate. They certainly do, though some are more recent. Fall from Grace steps back. Some of these wounds would have would have been fatal to a normal man. She taps her chin, thinking, What do you intend to do now? I need to get my memories back. And my life back. I intend to scour the plains and search inside myself until I can piece together who I am and what brought me to this state. Falls from Grace is still thinking, her finger tapping on her chin. I must say, I've never met a man who had lost himself in the literal sense. She raises an eyebrow. Forgive me, but your condition is intriguing. Intriguing. Frightening is more, I li more like it. I don't like not knowing who I am, what I may have done, who my enemies are, and who are my friends. I have offended you with my words. Falls from Grace bows her head. I give my apology, if you would have it. Never mind, no harm done. Falls from Grace nods. If it will help, you are welcome to tour the brothel. Several of the students are well versed in the verbal arts. Perhaps some of them will be able to rekindle your memories. I may do that. Updated my journal. Would you like to join me on my travels? The moment she had voice acting, I'm like, does she join the party? Anna stiffens, then starts muttering under her breath. Who's to say she'll be coming with us? We don't have any need likes of her, so as we don't. Travel with you? Fall from Grace smiles slightly. She seems to be ignoring Anna. It's rather forward of you. Yeah, no, I don't know why we're. I don't know why this is happening exactly. That was such a quick, a quick escalation. Although when she had voice acting, I wondered if she was a player character. I'd rather be honest with my intentions. You seem extremely pleasant and well-versed in the ways of the plains. A companion with that kind of knowledge would be welcome. I appreciate your candor. I shall counter with some of my own. Why should I travel with you? You're a sensei. Surely there must be a limit to how much you can learn here. I think you'd be surprised. If you want to accompany me to accompany you on your travels, I need far more compelling reason than that. You mean you wouldn't be interested in traveling with an immortal amnesiac who is searching the plains for himself? Oh, I would be extremely interested. She smiles slightly. Such a suggestion is intriguing. Make no mistake about that. Then you would like to travel with me, then. If you wish me to, then there is something you must do for me. There are ten students in this establishment. I would like you to speak to all of them, then return to me with your thoughts. Then we shall see if, you, if we shall travel together or not. 
Very well. Updated my journal. Can you tell me about the girls here? The women here are aspiring sensates. They've come to me in search of instruction, to prepare themselves to enter the faction. Also, many of them have a natural grasp of language that can shatter the crust of the most hardened individual. I see. So, ladies in training, so to speak. Is this different or the same? Yes, I hope that by learning the art of language and its subtleties, that the patrons and students here may learn more about themselves. One is only as limited as their command of language. To be able to employ language to evoke emotions in others is a tremendous skill. I think that's it for now. Yep, there she is. Falls from Grace is a succubus, one of the Tanari. A creature literally formed from the raw chaos and evil. Her body and mind are the perfect template to tempt a man of any species, any age. She is the proprietress of the brothel of slating intellectual lusts. So she's made of chaotic evil. But is she chaotic evil? Or is she, cause like she's just running, like this doesn't seem like a chaotic evil thing to do. But who knows? It's strange. It's, it's funny to me that right when I asked about who our last party member would be, I met her. But I was kind of getting the idea we might be running out of chances to meet her. Like, like, unless this starts getting filled in with new zones, which it might not, that might be why it's cut off separately, just to imply there's more, but not so much. Like, this might be basically the whole game. A small re a small series of neighborhoods, like in Disco. Galora. This dark-haired, dark pale-skinned woman has a cultured, refined look about her. As she turns to you, you notice that her eyes, which you had previously thought to be gray, are the color of brushed steel. Greetings. The woman's voice is soft calm and without inflection. It has a certain far away quality, as if someone not attached to her. As if somehow not attached to her. Greetings. I am called Delora. How may I serve you somehow? In what ways can you serve me, Delora? She blinks her eyes, then touches her hand to her heart, bowing her head slightly. I am able to debate any scholarly or academic matter quite proficiently. If that were your wish. I am also well versed in various games of strategy, should you wish to play something. And I have the materials for few such games here. Or though I have the materials for few such games here. Subject now conversing with human male. Is that related to what I did here? Debate, you say? Delora nods. That is correct. I am neither a tome nor a tutor. I have no desire to educate my patrons. Should you have a matter to discuss, however, the fifteen factions and their effect on Sigillian politics, the most effective battle stratagems for warring in, in Archeron, Acheron, the meaning of existence itself, I would be most pleased to choose a counterpoint and engage you in debate. Hmm. Choose a topic, see if you can best her. You make a serious effort, but it's to no avail. Delora easily and unhesitantly crushes each of your arguments with her infallible sense of logic. But we're not going to present that. She seems to take no joy in her victory, however, and merely offers, If you would like, we can debate once more upon the same topic. I could argue your position this time, should you desire it. Wait, are you always so ruthless in a debate? Dolores nods. Mistress Grace instructed me to show no mercy, for another of her students will always allow always allows a patron to win after a lengthy debate. It was Mistress Grace's desire that I provide a different sort of experience for the clientele. So the other one just lets people win on purpose. 
I see. Could we play a game now? Of course. Is there anything in particular you wish to play? No, I don't really remember any games. Here, then. Allow me to show you one. Delora brings out her a thin, lacquered box, which unfolds into a small board marked with a grid. The contents of the box prove to be a number of polished stone chips, half of them black, half of them white. This game goes by many names. Shall I explain the rules to you? Yes, please. Dolores explains to you the rules of the game, how the chips are moved, how one bests one's opponent. It seems, however, somehow faint, uh, faintly familiar to you. The rules are simple, yes, but a great deal of complexity lies within the game itself. It takes a great deal of time to master. Shall we play? Yes, let's. Despite your being certain you've played before, Delora defeats you easily. She does not smile or gloat, however, but quietly begins to put the game away. You seem to possess a decent understanding of the game. In time, you could become quite proficient. Do you always play so mercilessly? Delora nods. Mrs. Grace instructed me to hold nothing back, for another of her students plays so that her opponent will always just manage a win. It was Miss. You have different experience, true challenge. Re it was Mr. Is Mistress Grace's desire that I provide a different sort of experience, a true challenge, rather than something that might be more pleasing to one's ego. She did phrase it differently. It just sounded like she might be saying the same thing. <clears throat> I understand. I had some questions for you. Delora casts her eyes on the floor with a sound that might be a sad sigh. I am willing to serve you as a patron, but have no wish to answer your questions at this time. My apologies, but I fear you shall simply have to bear with that for the time being. What's wrong? Anything I can help you with? Updated my journal. She looks up from the floor and into your eyes. One mo Once more you're struck by the pale smoothness of her skin the cold depths of her silvery eyes. No. No, I fear not. My troubles are a matter of the heart. In time, I think, all things shall be resolved. Are you certain there's nothing I can do? Certain? Delora pauses, as if thinking. No. I am not. My, st my first love, Merry Man, possesses still the keys to my heart. So long as he has them, I shan't be free to love another. This is the cause of my melancholy. Then I'll find this merry man. Speak to him on your behalf. Updated my journal. Delora nods, the slightest hint of a smile appearing on her lips. She bows her head. Were you to find and speak with Merriman, I would be most grateful. He is a member of the Society of Sensation. So you may wish to ask for him at the Civic Fest Hall. I'll return when I find him. Farewell. Alright, let's go do that then, because for all I know, all these people might have stacking uh, tasks. Let's try to take them one at a time, if I can. All right. There's also, of course, more, more town around here. Old poet. And Eli Havelock. Show me Splinter. Montague Murder Sense. What's his name again? I lost it Im immediately. Still looking for a birdcage. Merriman.
No one here seems to have that name, so I, I should probably talk to the guide out front. There's someone I was looking for here. Merriman. Merriman is usually pacing back and forth around the lecture halls. Travel at the middle door on the eastern wall, then and the door beyond that as well. He will likely be wandering within the hallways you'll find yourself in. He just walks around? I did not see him. There he is. Also, like, that's a bizarre thing to be known for. Hi, I'm Merriman. I'm known for walking around in circles in this hallway all the time. Don't do anything else. Like, what? Like, usually it's like, ah, oh, they're usually out there tending the, the farm because they work on a farm. Ah, oh, they're usually studying. It's some kind of, like, thing to do? Merriman's just working on his cardio, walking around the strangely shaped hallway every day. This man looks like a bitter cantankerous old codger. His mouth is twisted into a frown that becomes even more severe as he notices you coming his way. Merriman, my name may be, but merry I am not. Off with you, young one. No time for the likes of you. He goes into a fit of coughing with the exertion of shooing you away so loudly. Wait, Delora wanted me to speak with you. Merriman eyes you suspiciously. Not so. About what, huh? Hmm? Well? She says that you're her first love, and that so long as you hold the keys to her heart, she'll never be free to love another. She told you that, eh? I'm surprised. Perhaps leaving her under Mistress Grace's tutelage did what I couldn't. Started to develop her feelings. In any case, he pats a pocket on his tunic, I won't just give the keys to you. Wait, those are literally the keys to her heart. He nods. That they are. Delora is a construct. Didn't you know that? A creature of sorcery and clockwork mechanics she is, and one of my finest creations. Merriman sighs. But cold. With emotion. Without emotion or character. I brought her to the brothel and set her so that she could not leave, in the hopes that the constant contact with so many others would begin to develop her own personality. The keys are the tools used to set her. She wants them because she feels that they're limiting her potential growth, her personal growth somehow now, I suspect. Then why don't you just return them to her? Merriman scowls. Because I've become a cruel and bitter old man who sees he can get something out of you. Go on, then what do you want? I want. I want to forget. I've lived almost 150 years now, and I've seen every sensory stone I've cared to in this grand hall. I have little time left to live, and I'm too weak to go out in search of wholly new experiences. So I need to find a way to forget them all. That way I can start again in my final days. So do I just wallop you in the back of the head or what? My journal. No, you bloodthirsty lummox. I'll need something, some item, some concoction that will allow me to forget. Like a draft of the River Styx, something like that. You know what the River Styx is? Does the River Styx exist in this universe? What does that mean? Like you don't know what you'll know, you don't actually know what would co what would do this for you. You just kind of just you think that if you'd seen every single sensation possible from the sensates, you would be knowledgeable of a way to lose memories if it existed, right? I'll return if I find something. Farewell. <clears throat> Do 
we can try to to split pestle and kill into two people. And apparently the suggestion of the water of the river sticks is uh less metaphorical than expected cuz he actually wrote the the water of the river sticks in the journal. Uh I'm trying to think like cuz the whole game is about ha having lost memories and trying to get them back. I'm gone. I'm trying to remember if there was somebody who could specifically make you lose your memories and if that's the thing we've discovered before. Might have to just think about that more. Right, some of these guys. Old poet. This kindly looking old kindly looking old man spares you only the briefest of glances before he returns to his recitation. Heckle the poet. Your heckling, consisting of little more than cries of Poetry stinks, and the occasional raspberry draws a few annoying glances, but nothing more. Alright. Can't understand any of that either. Eli Havelock. His, this narrow-eyed, sharp-faced man is scanning his surroundings with a look of vague disinterest, pausing occasionally to look down and pick up, pick at his fingernails. Despite being clothed in silk and velvet finery, he manages to look unsavory and more than a little dangerous. Greetings. The man looks your way. His eyes are dark slits, like narrow stab wounds beneath his brow. His voice is low and gruff despite his slender build. Pike off. Not yet. Not yet. I had some questions. You think I wander the war looking for strangers to, spy to spill dark for? Now, pi uh, uh, uh. now pike off. <laughs> Why are you here then? To be surly with passersby? Heh. <laughs> He stands quietly for a moment, then breaks a crooked smile. That's good, that. He considers you for a moment. I'm a tutor at the Civic Fest Hall. Name's Havelock. Eli Havelock. As a veteran scout, I teach the art of subterfuge. Oh, it's this guy. You're the Fest Hall Thieves tutor. Listen, Kusai won't let me train as a warrior. He says I could just steal an opponent's weapon, leaving them defenseless. What do you think? He shakes his head. Not true, Cutter. Even I'd have to admit that the battle must still be fought. To rely on theft alone is a mistake. Thanks, Eli. My journal. Wait. If, if Kusai is doing what I think he is doing, he won't let you off just like that. If he needles you about hiding and the like, tell him that no scout, not even myself, has mastered stealth to such a degree, and some foes can't be hidden from. Your scent, or very thoughts, will give you away. Got it. Thanks again, and farewell. He told me to go fuck myself, but he was actually helpful. That was my quest objective all along. I'm gone. Hiding in plain sight right outside the front door. But I'm, but I'm still filling in this map. I spoke to Eli about what you said earlier, and even he admitted that the battle must still be fought. To rely on theft is a mistake. After a time, he nods. One may hide if one cannot be seen. One cannot be attacked. One is invulnerable. But no thief, even Eli, has mastered stealth to such a degree, and some foes can't be hidden from your scent, or your very thoughts will give you away. After a short wait, he nods. Mighty spells can smite many, can spite, can smite many foes more quickly than any blade. You won't trade me then, Kyusai sees no need. You have failed to convince Kyusai otherwise. Perhaps you should speak to the mage tutor here. If you do not wish to train beneath her, she might prove a counterpoint to my argument. She updated my journal. I apparently have already talked to her. 
I spoke to Lady Thorncombe about what you said earlier. She said that mages are physically deficient. Their spells merely crutches against their deficiency. When one sorcery is spent, the core of combat still remains. 10,000 experience. He smiles slightly, making a deep, rumbling sound in his throat. Kusai finds you fit to teach. Meet Kusai in the training chamber. I'll be there shortly. Well now, this should be good. 